What's up everyone, my name is Cody Engel, I am a staff software engineer, and I enjoy writing good unit tests. So early on in my career, I was finishing up a feature and a senior software engineer, they asked, hey, do you have any unit tests for this? I was like, yeah, I do, I, I, I manually tested it. What I was saying in my head, I just blurted out yes, because we didn't do code reviews on this team, no one ever really corrected me on that. I didn't actually realize that the unit tests should have been automated. They should have been actual like code that I was writing. It wasn't until later on in my career where a manager really wanted us to write a lot of unit tests. He wanted us to do test room development, all of that good stuff that I realized, oh wait, I did not unit test that code that I said I unit tested. So in this video, I wanna talk about how do you actually write good unit tests? If you stick around until the end of the video, you will know what I do now that I do know how to write good unit tests. So that way you can hopefully avoid making the same mistake that I did where you just say, oh yeah, I was writing unit tests not realizing that, hey, you actually weren't. Let's first talk about how do you test the like button. In order to do that, you just gotta go down below, you gotta click the like button, you see if it turns blue. If it does, you know it's working. And with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the video. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is let's actually define what are unit tests. Essentially, a unit test is testing a single branch of code executes correctly. What a unit test is not, is it is not validating that the single unit test makes sure that an entire class works. That's, that's not the point of a unit test. A unit test is making sure that one unit of code within that class, within that test subject, executes as expected. It either returns an error, it returns a successful result. We now know that a unit test is testing a single branch of code. That may mean that it's testing a single line of code, or maybe that single line has a couple of tests around it. So the first thing that you wanna do with writing any sort of unit test is you wanna make sure that you are getting this correct behavior from the class itself. So you are testing the behavior, you are not verifying that some code is actually being executed. I made this mistake in my career once where we wanted to write a bunch of UI tests and the framework that was used for testing UI was really slow. So we thought, hey, we should just write our own custom framework under the hood. We used a bunch of verify statements that verified that the correct function on the view was being called correctly. And one thing that we noticed about three or four months later on was every single time that our view changed, the test for our view had to change as well, even though the behavior didn't change. You still got the same output, but the tests had to change with the code changing. This ends up being a bit of a code smell because if you are writing unit tests that are testing the behavior of that function, you can change the underlying code of that function and as long as the behavior is still correct, the test will still pass. So another thing to keep in mind when you are making sure that you're testing only the behavior is if you're writing some tests for code that wasn't done with TDD in mind, feel free to reformat your code if the way your code was written doesn't allow you to write tests that validate the behavior. The next thing to keep in mind with writing good unit tests is your test setup must be super simple. In the past, I've written unit tests where the test setup itself required a lot of just manual, like copying and pasting code. It wasn't a ton of fun. Uh, essentially, there was just a bunch of duplicated code throughout every single test. Whenever someone wanted to go and change that class, I would find they didn't really wanna add more unit tests or they didn't want to modify the class because they didn't know how to change the unit tests because the setup was so complicated. So good unit tests, they should be super simple to set up. Tests, they are just code. What actually goes into writing a good solid class also goes into writing a good solid test. So if you have to write some functions, some factories, some things that just make your life easier for writing tests, do that. What I've done is I like to generate random data for my tests because for the most part, my tests don't depend on any specific string or any specific number. They usually depend on some sort of predefined pattern. And so I'll write functions that are like generate random string and that generates just a random string for me. I'll have one that's generate random number and it'll give it a range. And so you could say, as long as it's between zero and 50, it's valid. Another one might be using that random range to generate a random list of strings. So you're writing some code that takes a list of strings. You want to verify 
that it is working correctly. And so you just say, hey, generate a list of 50 strings and I'm gonna make sure that this function handles those strings correctly. Another one might be generate a random domain name. Another one might be generate a random name or generate a random email address. If you write that code up front, you will find yourself reusing that time and time again. You will also realize that the tests are becoming much easier to write because you don't have to worry about actually generating that data. That's not to say that you won't have like hard-coded string values in your tests from time to time. That will happen when your test requires that very specific string. Another one, getting into factories but a bit more advanced, is if you are using a mocking framework and you are doing some more difficult mocks where it requires just a lot of setup for those mocks, extract that into a factory as well. Really, any time that you're writing code that is just a lot of manual labor to do, extract it into a function, someone else will most likely use it in the future. It's not throwaway code. So extract as much as you possibly can to encourage reuse of those different things in your tests. And if you are writing unit tests that are in a given when then format, another thing that I've learned and have found out is you can actually extract those given parts into their own functions as well. So the given is essentially setup code to, to say that given that this test is in this specific state, so your function would be setting up the test subject to be in that specific state. The when is actually executing something on the subject, so usually running a specific function. You can extract that into its own function as well. That way, if the function name ever changes, the parameters change a bit, you just change it in that one spot as opposed to changing it in like 10 or 12 different tests. And then the last one is the then part of your test function. I found that I usually don't extract the then portion because this is actually running the assertion on the test itself. But occasionally when the like verification portion or the assertion portion of the, the test is difficult to do, I'll extract that as well into its own function. It really just depends on what you're writing for the test. I found though in general, you will probably be able to extract every single given portion of a test and every single when portion of a test and you might be able to extract the then portion as well. And so then your test class, when you're writing, or your test function, when you're writing that, you just do given function name, when function name, and then you have your little little portion of asserting that the thing is working as, as you would expect. The next thing to keep in mind when writing really good unit tests is you wanna do a single assertion per test. Something that I found out the hard way is if you try to have all of your assertions in a single function, usually because your setup code was pretty difficult, you will usually wind up having the first assertion or the second assertion fail. And then all of the other assertions, because of the way that your unit test framework probably works, they won't actually run. So you won't be able to assert that the other behavior is actually working or not working. So another thing that happens when your tests are doing more than one assertion is the name of the test itself will usually be pretty generic. And the downside of that is when the test fails in a CI environment, you're now getting a generic test name with the failure. So you don't necessarily know exactly what happens. You have to actually go and look at the test, see what was the test asserting, and then see which assertion failed. Maybe it was the first assertion, maybe it was the second to last assertion, but you're going to have to actually go and rerun the tests, see and figure out like, all right, well, what is actually going on? Whereas the alternative, if you only have one assertion, per test, you can be very specific with that test name. So when the test fails in your CI environment, you will know this test failed for this specific reason. Of course, you'll still have to pull down the code and you'll have to actually modify the code to make sure that the test can still pass, but you will know exactly what the test was trying to do and why it failed. So going into that, you will have a much better idea of what the solution may actually be. And then the last thing, when you do have multiple assertions in a single test, is if one thing fails, you don't know if other things are failing. So that's a bit of a downside. One exception to this rule is that some unit test frameworks actually allow you to execute a test with multiple assertions. And if one of the assertions fails, the rest of the assertions can still be run. So this rule only applies if you are using a framework that does not allow for that. But if you are using a framework that allows for that, in general, you'll usually be able to give the assertion a really specific description. Make sure you use that description because if you don't, you're kind of going back to what we were just talking about where your test fails on CI, you now don't know why the test failed, 
and it's just not a good time. The next thing with making really good unit tests is you wanna keep your tests isolated. So good unit tests, they should be able to run alongside all of your other unit tests. They should be able to run randomly. They should be able to call on you know, static functions. They should be able to use the same resources and they should be able to pass every single time. If your tests are not isolated, so if your test depends on a, another test to run to set up some code, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to essentially just create flaky unit tests, which essentially turns into a test that it works well on your machine. It fails on someone else's machine. Sometimes it fails on CI, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it fails on your machine too, and you want to avoid that. One way that you can keep your tests isolated if you are using one of the XUnit frameworks, so like JUnit or PyTest, you can use a setup and a teardown function within your test class itself. And what that allows you to do is you can run some setup code. So you can set up your testing environment in a very specific way, and you can run some teardown code which will essentially reset everything back to zero, back to the way it was before the test ran. One misconception that I've, I've seen is people will think that the setup and teardown runs once per test class. It actually runs once per test function. So if you're using singletons, if you are depending on a database, anything like that, the teardown function is usually a really good one to keep in mind because you can then reset everything back to zero. Other tests can run, they can run in the same way that they would expect. They're not dealing with stale data that your test may have left behind. With keeping your tests isolated, you also want to try to make use of things like test fakes, test doubles, and mocks. We're not gonna get too in the weeds about that in this video, that would take way too much time, but my own personal preference is I generally will use mocks. The reason why is mocks require less actual coding to set up. There are usually mocking frameworks out there in every single language that you're going to use. So in Java, there's Makito. In Kotlin, there's Mach K. And they're set up in a very special way where I can say, every time that this class runs, it should return this specific value. And so instead of me actually having to code that implementation, I just tell the mock what to do and it does it. I will use these mocks for things that are pretty stateful or could be pretty flaky to just request directly. So instead of making a network request in my unit test, I will use a mock to mock out the network request. So every single time that I make a network request with these specific values, it will return this specific response. And that allows me to keep my tests, again, isolated. If the server is having a bad day, the unit test can still succeed because they aren't dependent on the server. Your mock will just always run the exact same thing. And so it keeps your test isolated. It keeps your test running in a consistent manner. You can essentially trust that your test is doing what it should do. So with that said, we now should know how to write pretty good unit tests. We know what unit tests are, which is really important. We know that we should only test the behavior of our code as opposed to verifying that actual specific code blocks are being executed. We know that our test setup should be super simple and that we should have a single assertion per test. And finally, our unit tests, they should be isolated so they you know, don't fail randomly because of some other thing happening. So that is it, that is the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already destroyed the like button for the YouTube algorithm, please go ahead, just, just go ahead and do that now. I also mentioned TDD in this video. I do hope to do a video specifically on TDD in the future, so be sure to get subscribed and click the notification bell so you know when I upload that video. We also have a growing Discord community. I will leave a link to that in the description below. In that community, we pretty much just chat about coding, we chat about software engineering. There's some gaming channels, some jobs channels, Again, it's still growing. We're not the most talkative people right now, but I am hoping that this will turn into a thriving community where folks can just ask questions to each other and get answers from one another. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you in the next one.